Hi there, how you doing? Uh, my name is Dana Emanuel. Um, I wanted to share my testimony. I am an ex-paranormal investigator. I am now a deliverance minister in Florida. Um, I wanted to share some of the information that I have learned um, out of the Bible comparing scripture with what I believed. Um, I do this video to give people a true understanding of what the paranormal really is and of spiritual warfare and the putting on of the full armor of God. I am sharing my testimony about how I came into the occult from a very early age and how it became an obsession of mine and where it eventually led me. I am also sharing with everyone some of the true paranormal accounts of hauntings that I experienced while in the paranormal field. As part of my research in the paranormal, the question that is often overlooked and almost always rejected by others, which often would come into my mind, and that was, are all these spirits that claim to be the spirits of our departed loved ones actually be demonic spirits masquerading as such? I finally came to realize the truth about what these entities really were. It wasn't until my family and I suffered a lot of spiritual attacks that I became desperate enough to get the answer to this question and by facing it head on and finally accepting the truth and the truth about Jesus and the truth about what the schemes of the enemy Satan really are. We're all born into a spiritual war. Some people are taught about it early in life and are equipped early and therefore are better prepared and protected from the schemes of the devil. But then there are some of us that learn later in life, having been de deceived and wounded by the enemy, suffering great loss in the battle, and we are not armed because we were not armed to fight. You see, although I attended church as a child, and although I knew about Jesus, I did not know the schemes of the enemy and did not know God's word. God's word is our sword. You see, God's word is our weapon against the enemy. I felt that since I believed that Jesus was real, I thought I was protected, no matter what I did. I thought that if I owned a Bible, of course, without actually reading it and applying it to my life, that I was protected. This is the very reason that even many Christians today become defeated. They do not truly believe in Jesus and have faith in him or simply give the battle to him. And most importantly, they do not obey him and his word. In order to fight the spiritual battle and have victory, having faith in Jesus was the only option I had left. And this was where my victory was ultimately found. Glory to God. In this video, I will examine what the Bible says about the afterlife and the spiritual world. I will tackle this subject from several directions, and I will do so in light of Scripture. I will discuss schemes of the enemy. I want to mention up front that in no way does this video glorify the work of Satan, but instead will warn others of his schemes, as the Bible tells us to be wise as serpents, and gentle as doves. I give this glory all, I'm sorry, I give this video all glory to God. 2 Corinthians 2.11 Lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. God forbids only those things that will harm us. One of the things he forbids is the act of consulting the dead. You see, Satan roams around seeking whom he may devour. Anything that God prohibits in the Bible is bad for our spiritual and or physical health. Satan probes us to find our weaknesses. He sifts us as wheat, you might want to say. One of our greatest weaknesses is our love for family members and friends. And we also have a natural compassion for those that are suffering and defenseless. When we have a family member who passes away, our grief we carry from our loss truly can be an opportunity for the enemy to take advantage of. 
he will carry, try to gain access to us through masquerading as our deceased loved ones. He will exhibit knowledge of things and show evidence in order to compel us to believe it is truly them. Satan is not omnipresent like God is, but the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, there are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in this world. So there are demonic spirits that are around us all the time to tempt us and to report to Satan when we sin or do anything against scripture. As seen in scripture, the, in the book of Job, Satan is the accuser. Scripture tells us to not consult the dead, and to do so is also an abomination to God. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth as the nation, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observer at times, and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. The Lord thy God will rise up, unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me unto him shall ye shall hearken and if you look at isaiah chapter 8 verse 19 and when they shall say unto you seek unto them that have familiar spirits and unto wizards that peep and that mutter should not a people seek unto their god for the living to the dead to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You see, and an abomination is something that is grossly detestable and is so out of the normal as opposed to what God was intended. Well, I'm sorry, normal as opposed to what was intended by God and carries a great implications for doing them. The reason God forbids us to consult the dead is because he knows that our departed loved ones are not the ones that would be responding to us. Scripture is very clear on the state of the dead and the impossibility of departed spirits to come back to communicate with us, which I will go over. All information coming from these per familiar spirits are meant to deceive us and to lead us astray. The way Satan works is he will mix truth in with lies. To gain our trust. God warns us that those with familiar spirits will defile us. To defile someone means to make one unclean or pollute morally. Here are some of the false messages that, that actually come from these spirits and the belief of earthbound departed spirits. I will list the scripture after each one to show to how it conflicts with God's word. There is no hell after we die. Because to believe that if people, uh, when they die and they come back and roam the earth, would, would suggest that they did not go to hell. People that are unbelievers and the wicked don't go to hell when they die, but instead just roam the earth. That's what this would suggest. It takes away our fear, fear of hell. If we are in control of what happens to us after we die and just stay here, hell is no longer a threat to us. The Bible tells us we should fear him that can destroy our bodies and our souls in hell. You see, that would also uh, be contrary to the belief that people just go to the grave and that that is what, you know... Um, that is the second death. But like this verse says, it tells us, you know, that we should fear him. Him that can destroy our bodies and our souls in hell. You see? Um, the belief of departed human spirits also 
would suggest that children who are under the age of accountability do not go to heaven when they die, but instead roam the earth lost as if a child were a bastard. Okay? As we know in the Bible, the Bible tells us that children are under the age of accountability. Children do not roam the earth lost. Um, God does not lose them. Um, and when these spirits... Uh, another one of the lies is that when the spirits of the deceased cry out that for some reason God cannot hear them or help them, but it would suggest that ghost hunters can, that, that, that's, that would be impossible. God tells us in the Bible that you know he knows every hair on our head. He knows every time a sparrow falls out of a tree and he says, how much do, do you mean to me? more than many sparrows. Um, when some people, it would suggest that when some people die, they get lost and God does not know where they are or that they, or that they even died, actually. Some people believe that, you know, well, the person died so quickly, God wasn't aware that they died. <laughs> Every man is appointed to die once and after that judgment, and God knows the end from the beginning. He knows every hair on our head. And every time, like I said, a sparrow falls out of a tree. And we are more important to him than many sparrows. We are so important to him. When we want to know the value of something, we look to see what someone is willing to pay for it, right? For example, like a house or a car. So when we question how much we mean to God, it can be asked, how much would he be willing to pay for us? And the answer, which is very clear in scripture, we mean so much to him that he purchased us with the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus. So you see, we are very valuable to God. Um, another point we can look at is in the case of Lazarus and the beggar. And we see that when the rich man died, the angels carried him to Abraham's bosom. And that don't the angels know when we die? Angels are camped around us always. Angels are always around. They encamp around us to protect us. God gives them charge over us as they would know where we are at all times. So this would mean we don't die and get lost. You know, angels behold the face of our Father in heaven. Just like in Matthew 18, 10 says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. You see, the angels that are assigned to us report things to God, their messengers. Hebrews 1 tells us this. Uh, in this belief of departed spirits that are earthbound, they claim that they need the ghost hunter to help them cross over into the light. What light are they referring to? Bible tells us that Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light of the world. This would in a sense be truthful though because the reason these familiar spirits, their true identity, cannot go to the light is because they are truly demonic spirits. Did Jesus ever help spirits of dead loved ones while he was on earth doing miracles? Not one mention of this in scripture. Does the Bible mention him sending anyone or even a ghost to a light? No. Okay. We cannot get our answers when we want to look at the paranormal and study what it really is. We cannot get true answers only depending on our five senses. You see, it's a spiritual matter. We cannot get these answers to the spiritual world using our five senses. We must get our answers from God. Any other source is merely opinions. We must not lean on our own understanding and the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. All paranormal research groups go by the philosophy, the proof is in the evidence. 
This rules out anything that is not seen, heard, smelled, or tasted. Anything of a spiritual nature would not be used as evidence. Besides, anything that you cannot detect with our five senses cannot be tested or measured. And anything detected that is indeed spiritual, one cannot prove exactly what it is. You see, Satan is a spiritual being, and he masquerades as something good. He can masquerade as something loving, peaceful, and all the traits that you would find in something good. Even a loving, caring grandmother. Satan counterfeits everything that God offers, even the Holy Spirit. There is no possible way for the paranormal investigator to determine if the spirit is good or bad unless they test the spirits. One can only use true discernment if they were to follow the guidelines given to us by God in his word. And true spiritual discernment must come from the Holy Spirit. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. As it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 10. The only way a believer can become sharp in their discernment is to read God's word and to become so familiar with it that they will know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error and distinguish which one it is. I once heard an analogy, an analogy that explained the concept well. It went something like this. There was a man that worked for the circuit, I'm sorry, secret service and his job was to know and detect counterfeit money. And someone asked him, how can you possibly keep up with learning all the counterfeit details and techniques and characteristics on the money? His answer was simply, I do not study all the counterfeit details. I only study the true money because as long as I am so familiar with the true bills, I will detect the counterfeit when I see it. And this is true. Even with scripture, if you know the scripture so well, you'll know the counterfeit when it comes, or the lies. It was when I heard this analogy that I could fully understand that we don't need to know all the evil schemes of the enemy, but instead, we just need to become sharp in understanding God's word. Because as long as we know God's word, we will be able to discern something when it is of the enemy. Like First John 4, 1 through 6 tells us, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus come, Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye heard, that it should come, and now already is in the world. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You see, that's what discernment of spirits is all about. Why would human spirits leave in the name of Jesus? Okay, if, they, if, 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 if the Bible is not true, why would these spirits leave in the name of Jesus? You see, even aliens, and this is even documented, aliens is reported to leave in the name of Jesus. Aliens, departed loved ones, even departed loved ones uh, that people see that they believe is the departed loved ones, um, that looks just like grandma, even talks like grandma. But when they say leave in the name of Jesus, the spirit will leave. You must test the spirits. Unresolved issues. A lot of people believe that they come back because of unresolved issues. Um... But the Bible says we forget anything under the sun. What does the Bible say about our mental state after death? And residual hauntings. Like I said, is this biblical? 
What happens to energy? Does energy dissipate or just stick around? What about electrical current to an electric chair? Or how about the EMF pumps we use to work with? Once we turn it off, the energy is lost. It did not return. The residual haunting logic is not supported scientifically or biblically. Okay, haunted homes and objects. What is the benefit for demons to hide in an object? The Bible says they wander in dry places, but they look for a human body to inhabit, or an animal. But the Bible never mentions demons being cast out of a home or an object. It was always people. Jesus, and you must know that Jesus in the Bible never sat in an alleged haunted home with paraphernalia <laughs> equipment to detect ghosts, or even demons for that matter. Usually when he was preaching in public, the demons would manifest in a person and he would cast it out. Or someone would bring their family member that was in torment and ask Jesus to deliver them. You see, Jesus gives believers that authority today. We can deliver someone. We can cast that out in the name of Jesus. It's not by our power, but by only the power of God. Now, cursed objects in a home, that's another story, will cause demonic activity. The items must be removed from the demons for the demons to leave the person alone. If the person refuses to get rid of an object, the person is essentially making an idol out of it because it is more important than God's, God's truth and the freedom he offers through Jesus. When anything is or becomes more important than God, it is an idol. Now, another subject that goes along with this. <clears throat> what about children or people who are quote unquote sensitive to spirits? They see them or hear them often where others don't see them at all. Why is that? Is it a gift from God? Or does the child's parents somehow have an open door to the demonic? Drug use can also be an open door to the demonic. An altered mind can become a devil's playground. It is as if our minds are kicked in neutral. We are allowing something else to take control of the driver's seat. Very similar to how meditations and yoga can cause demonic possession. What is demonic possession? When demonic spirits are in control of our minds, emotions, and will, because they have been given a legal right. There are levels of control we can give them. We can be oppressed by evil spirits and we can be possessed by them. They do not uh, actually own us, but they have been given permission to control us. Now, another, another thing that we used to um, come upon in the paranormal, and it was quite often, was casting out demons, okay, or cleansing a house, is how they pretty much usually put that. Um, but you have to look at scripture if you want to compare it to scripture. You have to look at this, the the story of the seven sons of Sceva. It's in Acts nineteen thirteen through twenty, and what it was about was these exorcist, okay, that tried to uh, have power over demonic spirits without actually knowing Jesus. And it eventually led to them getting physically hurt. So I'll go ahead and read this scripture. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. 
And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. You see, these, um, these spirits, if you do not have the power of Christ, okay, behind you or in you, when you go to cast out these spirits or think you're going to do a house cleansing, and it might not happen right away, okay, like, like in this case, but I have personally seen, experienced, and I even have it on film, um, is the fact that when you go to try to try to uh, go against these evil spirits and you're not a, a, a true believer or a Christian, um, you can physically get harmed. You can get hurt. Um, I have seen personally a man get thrown across, a, <laughs> literally into a wall so hard that it sounded like something outside hit the house, okay? At the same moment that this man was thrown across the, like I said, across the room into the wall, when he was thrown into that wall, at the same moment, his grandmother, or their, the people's grandmother that lived in the home, was thrown off the front porch at the same time. So, you know, they can be dangerous. Um, I've even heard of ghost hunters that died or eventually were killed. Um, by circumstances that were mysterious that only pretty much looked like it was from something demonic, a demonic spirit um, that actually killed them. One of them was one of the mo real famous ghost hunters on, uh, I think it was called Ghost Hunters International, um, but there was a man on there and he, he was actually killed and he had told his family that he was being haunted by a spirit that was trying to pull him towards it and, and things like that, and he was being tormented by it. Well, um, the family was sitting there one day, and they heard noises in the bathroom. He was in the bathroom, and they heard a loud thug. They went in there, and he was on the floor, dead, asphyxiated. And they said that he had a line across his neck where something had choked him or, or you know, killed him that way. But nothing could be found that did it. So, um there's a lot of cases in failed exorcisms by people that were of different faiths that were not Bible believing Christians <laughs> um, that that you know were true believers. So it's a warning, you know. Do not, do not, don't play on the devil's playground. Um, you know, a person can get hurt doing that. Uh, when we were in the ghost hunting, what we would do was we didn't go by the beliefs of the Bible. We went by, like, say, for instance, if we went to a home uh, and that home had beliefs in uh, shamanism, okay, we would go in there and burn sage. Um, we would do the things that the shamans would do. We would do things like, say, for instance, um, Catholicism. We would go in there with our rosary beads and our holy water and things like that. Actually, the day that that man was thrown across the room or into the wall, uh, that's what we had that day was holy water. And we had we went around and we were blessing the house with holy water and praying and all this um, before that even happened. So, um, you know, that's, that's called syncretism. And it's it's a uh, it's a worldview that actually fails. <laughs> Secretism holds a belief of relativism. It suggests that everyone is correct in what they believe, even if two people believe differently about a particular subject. Secretism suggests that everyone is right in what they believe about their faith, even if they believe there is no God, then they're correct. That's, that's what syncretism is. They believe that it's like they believe in everyone's belief, <laughs> even if it's wrong, you know. Uh, so if one belie one person believes in God, they are right, and if the other person believes there is no God, they're also right, you know, and that, that can't be, you know. Um, this belief suggests that there is no real truth, 
but that truth is only non-factual and based on each individual's understanding, regardless of facts or evidence provided for such beliefs. Um, like I said, we used to use the uh, holy water, sage. We used to um, pray to St. Michael, the archangel, which is also necromancy. Uh, you're not supposed to, and you're not supposed to give charge over angels. God gives charge over, God gives charge of angels over us. Um, Wicca, they use salt around the property and home. This isn't in the Bible. The Bible says we are the salt. <laughs> We're the salt of the world. Um, in witchcraft, uh, much of the rituals used is a counterfeit to what God intends for believers to do in the spirit. Binding and loosing, for example. Uh, binding and loosing is not something that is done by verbal uh, commands and a magic wand. We are blessed or cursed depending on our actions, depending on our obedience or disobedience to God. And yes, uh, it can also be by verbal confession, uh, but it's not like verbal command. If, if you're going against God's will and in your actions, but you verbally command him to do something else, that's witchcraft. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not the right way. <laughs> um, let's see. Another thing I had learned one time I, um, our house was, you know, this was when we were under a lot of attacks. Okay. Um, this was like probably the last year of me being in the paranormal. We had things happen the whole time, pretty much. Um, but it got really ugly, you know. Uh, they do eventually, these spirits do eventually uh, let you know, or how do I say it? Their true identity comes out. You know, the Bible tells us in every sin is only pleasurable for a season. And the thing about the paranormal and, it, and getting into that, it, it's so fun and it's so... Uh, it, it just, you know what I mean? It's a thrilling factor behind it. But the thing about it is, it only lasts so long, and then it gets ugly. Um, a lot of people, including myself, when I was in the paranormal, and people would talk and say, you know, these uh, spirits you're talking to, they're all demons. You're not talking to these spirits of our departed loved ones. And you're not supposed to do that, you know? Well... I didn't believe it. I really did not believe it. And I rebuked that. When people would tell me that, I would rebuke it. And I, I, you know, deep down, the truth of the matter was, I was, I didn't want them to ruin my fun. Um, like I said, it was a thrilling thing. We enjoyed going out and doing our ghost hunts. We did so all the time, almost every week. Um, you know, on the weekends, we'd go somewhere and we'd ghost hunt and everything. But it was a lot... It was a lot of um, thrill behind it. And, you know, it's almost like, you know, think about like when you watch the scary movies, you know, like about haunted houses or whatever. When you're watching it, you're scared. But, and you'll sit there and as the thing is coming out or whatever, you start covering up your face and you look, you know, and you cover up your face and you look, you know, it's a, it's not right our bodies, our spirit, <laughs> our conscience that God gives us says, that's scary, stay away from it, it's dark. But then the other part of us that gets thrilled and, you know, our flesh, you know, wants to play with that and, and wants to, you know, um, yield to the temptations of it. So it's just something that we, we shouldn't do. We just shouldn't do it. It's almost like it's, it's almost like drugs, you know. It feels good and everything, but then you come down off of it. It has its repercussions. And the reasons that it's wrong for us, the Bible tells us it's wrong for us for a reason. People think God is just an unfair God, and they feel like, you know, why would God tell us we can't talk to our deceased loved ones? You know, that's not fair. You know, we grieve and we want to see them. There's nothing wrong with that. But what people don't realize is the reason God doesn't allow it and he forbids it is because it's not our deceased loved ones that answer us. They can't. You know, if you look at Luke 9, 16 or 19, I think it's 16. 
um, you know, the story of Lazarus, the rich man and the beggar, you know, um, at the end of that chapter, it tells us, it says, um, he, he was begging Abraham. He says, you know, um, go warn my family that, you know, they not also come to this place of torment. And he said, if some, if they do not hear Moses and my prophets, they will not believe though one come back from the dead. And if they're not, if God's not going to allow the dead to go back to warn our loved ones to not to go to hell, okay, he's not going to let them come back to tell you anything else. There's nothing more important. Um, it's just not going to happen. It, that story itself is very clear that it cannot be done. And it says, and beside all this, there is a great gulf fixed. In other words, it's there. It, won't, it cannot be moved. Um, that one that's there cannot come over to here or leave. And same on the other side. They cannot go back and forth. So... Um, anyway, when we were going through these torments, I'm going to go back on the subject. Uh, when we was going through these torments at our home, I had bought a audio book about deliverance and it had these, um, deliverance prayers on it. And what I would do is I had my laptop going at nighttime and I would let it play out loud. And when I, you know, we would, uh, play these pr prayers one night, my husband was there in the bed, and, and this spirit would come in our room often. And you would hear it. You would literally hear something like bump against stuff, and you'd feel it like hit the bed on the side of the bed. Um, one one time, I remember in particular, me and my husband was laying there in bed. We have a king-size bed. We had one then. And it literally felt like as if my grandson had got up on the bed come up between us and was squeezing between us. And when I felt that, and my husband had felt it too, but he was facing the other way and I was facing the other way. I reached my arm back, you know, to like hug my grandson and, you know, give him a pat. And I reached around there and he, I didn't feel nothing. And I turned around and my husband was still over on the other side of the bed. And I said, oh my gosh. I mean, I, I, it freaked me out because there was nothing there. And I felt something that literally was trying to squeeze. It felt like something was trying to squeeze between me and my husband, which like I said, my husband, there was a little bit of, of, of distance there, enough to where I know it wasn't him. And when I said, oh my God, did you feel that? And my husband jumped up and he felt, and he turned around and he, you know, was trying to feel too. And he turned around. And he said, oh, my God, I thought that was Buddy. And I said, me too. And so, you know, we had instances like that where we knew something was in the room. And not just that. you would, when, when we would feel like something was in the room and you would hear little things in the room moving around or whatever, it was such a feeling of darkness and evil. Um, it's hard to describe unless you go through it. Um, have you ever watched a really scary movie and then go to bed and have nothing on and just have to lay there in the dark? And you know that real f bad feeling you get and that dark feeling you get? It's like that, but on high <laughs> because you know something's there. And there, you, you know what I mean? It's like, and who are you to battle something spiritual? And no, just not knowing what it might do, you know? Um, but anyway, and this was actually after I had witnessed that man get thrown into the wall. So I knew, you know what I mean? It's like I knew what it, what they can do. And so, um, so I had bought this audio and I was playing it on my laptop at night because of these instances that we suffered. And this one night, my husband felt something coming in the room again. And it woke him up. And at the same time, my audio was playing on my laptop because it was an eight-hour audio book that I had bought. I think it was from Chip Ingram, something about an invisible war or something like that. But anyway, um, so my husband, right away, when he was hearing the prayers on the audio, he started to say them. 
And when he started to say them, all of a sudden, the fan at the foot of our bed went flying across the room. And I mean, it just went bam right into the wall. And when that happened, I woke up and, and I, my husband, at, you know, grabbed my shoulder and he was like, Dana, Dana. He said, cut that off. Cut that off. He said, whatever it is, I don't like that. Cut it off. And I said, I don't care what it doesn't like. And I was like, I mean, I just was like, what in the world? Well, I told my husband, I said, you know, I said, yeah, I, I was wanting to get my husband to get deliverance done because I felt like that at the time, like I said, I was still unaware that it was all demonic, okay? I was still believing that there's departed spirits of our dead loved ones that had, you know, hadn't gone crossed over. And I believed in residual hauntings, which is non-intelligent hauntings. I believed in, you know, um, even angels, that it might be some kind of angels or something, you know. But, but anyway, the thing about it is, I, I wasn't still, um, I still didn't know all the truth yet. So I kept thinking that the spirit from that one investigation where the guy was thrown had attached to my husband. And I kept thinking, well, you know, I don't know what to do. So what I did was I bought a bunch of rosary bead necklaces and I hung them all around the house, over the windows, over the door seals. Every door in my house literally had those rosary beads hanging. And I had Bibles. I started collecting Bibles and I, I would open them up to, I think it was John three sixteen or something like that. I forget which verse it was. But I took and I bought anointing oil and I put it on my books, on the Bibles, and I had them open to that particular uh, verse. And I had them in all the rooms, even the bathroom, even the closets, in my washroom even. But I had them in every room thinking I was protecting the house, you know, from these spirits or trying to ward them off. <laughs> and so anyway, um, so my another night, my husband had there was something attacked him and in this attack he literally woke up because he, it was almost like a dream or a very vivid like dream he had and he dreamed that a woman was trying to seduce him and then it was evil though and it and it and it, and it attacked him and so anyway he he woke up and next thing you know he had he got a hold of one of the rosary beads and um, actually I think he was probably wearing it because he did wear one all the time back then, you know, during this part of our life, <laughs> you know. But anyway, and he, he had it and he was yelling and he said, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. I he, Get out of my house. And he was, you know, yelling and everything. Well, when he said, in the name of Jesus, the rosary bead necklace popped. And when it did, beads went everywhere. And it was like, you know, it was, I don't think it's because of the beads. I think what it was was the demonic spirits were, um, you know, responding to the name of Jesus. And they just busted the beads to make a show out of it. You know, it was almost like they were sh showing him that the beads weren't protecting nothing. So, so anyway... Um, it got, it got really bad. I mean, you know, things, like I said, things were being thrown. My husband was getting physical attacks. Um, and then my grandson, which lived with us and, you know, and we, um, uh, was taking care of him. Um, he was three years old at the time and he was in my room one night. And this was like right during that time when all this stuff was happening. And he was in my room, we was in the living room. And it got really quiet. He was in my room watching TV while he was sitting on my bed. And uh, it got real quiet. And something told me to check on him. I just felt like, uh, you know, I need to check on him. So I, I went around the corner and I went in the room. And I noticed him sitting up on the bed. And he looked like stunned, like he's seen something that scared him. And I said, what's the matter? He said, I don't know. It's a monster or something. And I said, what do you mean? He said... I don't know. He said, my ghost or monster or something. And I said, there ain't no such thing as no monsters or no ghosts. You know, because he didn't know about what, you know, my ghost hunting and all that stuff. So, 
Um, I mean, I did keep that away from him. But anyway, and I was like, there ain't no monster in here. I don't see no monster. And he, and I said, where'd the monster go? And he jumped off the bed and he starts rubbing his hand on the, across the carpet. And he said, I don't know. And he looked really confused. And he says, it went in the floor or something. And he didn't know. He, he was confused. It disappeared. <laughs> and it was just there. So you see... When that happened, that was, I mean, he, that, my grandson is my heart, you know. And I mean, that really, really got to me. That was, that was the line in the sand that was drawn. And I, I was like, okay, that's it. I, and I told my husband, I said, look, I said, I think, because I said, since you're the one that's getting a lot of these spiritual attacks, I think that there's an attachment on you and we need, I'm going to take you to a church or something and try to get you delivered. And I said, I think that this thing needs to be cast out of you. And so finally he agreed. Um, we, you know, me and my husband went to church every so often, you know, like on holidays or whatever, and every now and again. But uh, I was the one that mostly went to church. We both believed and had, we believed that Jesus existed and was who he said he was. But we were very ignorant of the Bible, and, and, you know, we didn't have faith on Jesus. We didn't believe on him, is what I meant to say. Um, so anyway, I took him that next week to a church. I had seen it online on certain videos and, and uh, um, like, blog talk radio. I seen a couple of preachers on there that talked a lot about deliverance, and I listened to them a lot. And I, but they also talked a lot about the Bible. So that's where I was getting a little bit of, you know, are these spirits really, you know, maybe they are all demons. I mean, it was just, I was really looking into it. And it was almost as if the spirits knew that I was starting to come on the truth, you know, to come to believe in it. Maybe these are really all demons, you know. And it seemed like the more I started believing that, the more they started to turn against me. You know, and they, they were, you know, getting more violent and hateful and stuff like that. You know, they were no longer the, the friendly ghosts that, you know, that I had encountered um, in my investigations and stuff, you know. So um, I went and took my husband that next week. We went up to uh, talk to a preacher after the service. It was a actually a, pra a prayer counselor. He's actually the assistant pre uh, pastor of the church. And we went up after the service, and I told him, I said, look, I said, me and my husband both, and I told the preacher, I said, look, I said, um, I am a paranormal investigator, and I said, and I, I believe that I was on an investigation a while back, and I, there was a, um, um, a man that was thrown, and I believe that that spirit attached to me, and now it's been tormenting my husband. And that preacher said, well, gosh, you're going to have to stop doing what you're doing. And I said, why is that? And he says, well, he says, that's dabbling into the occult. And he said, you know, that's probably the very reason why all this is happening. And he says, you're not supposed to talk to the dead and everything. That's against the Bible. And I don't know why, but <clears throat> up until this point, like I said, I was starting to realize more and more that this was a truth you know about about the spirits but when he said that it just it rang truth with me finally <laughs> it was almost like god just he knew i was desperate enough and i was at the moment that i was ready to accept it maybe and he he, he opened my eyes because i finally i i was like okay you know wow okay maybe you know i am gonna have to stop doing this then you know um, cause it was an obsession of mine. I mean, it was, it was huge for me to give up. <laughs> I, at this point in time, I had my own paranormal investigation team. We used to go all kind of places and stay overnight, stay at weekends at different places and do ghost hunts. I had my, uh, you know, IR cameras, stationary cameras with CCTV systems. I had all kind of equipment enough for me and my whole team, you know? And I had my EMF pumps, my um, ghost boxes, you name it. I even I even sold dowsing rods. So I had a whole bunch of dowsing rods and crystal balls, pendulums. I mean, I mean it, it was a lot of stuff I ended up getting rid of. 
But anyway, um, enough of that because, you know, that, that stuff means nothing, nothing compared to the truth. You know, um, the truth is what sets us free. Amen. Well, anyway, um, so at this point, the, the preacher started praying for us. And like I said, I'm sitting there thinking, my husband's got an attachment and he needs deliverance. <laughs> so this guy started preach, uh, I'm sorry, praying with us. And as he's praying, he's praying for me too. And I got this feeling that just overwhelmed me. And it was like a feeling of panic, fear, and that I needed to get out of there now. <laughs> I mean, I it scared me. I just, I don't know what it was. I just felt like I got to get out of here. It, it was like an awful feeling. It was like a panic like I've never experienced. <laughs> um, it was just a big panic that I had. And I couldn't understand why. Because I'm like sitting there thinking, I got to get this done. I, You know, um, we have to do this. We have to do this. I mean, my desperation overrid my fear that I was feeling and all this stuff, you know, and I wasn't even realizing what was going on. But what it was is I was literally experiencing the manifestation of both worlds coming together and colliding. <laughs> what it was was God was delivering me of these evil spirits that was in me, these familiar spirits that I had been talking to all that time. And they were fearful when this presence of God went to cast them out. <laughs> and I, I, I just suddenly felt like I knew that's what was going on. And I, as scary as I, as it was and how I felt I, and as fearful as I felt on one side, I also felt like I got to get this out. I got, and I started praying in the name of Jesus. You got to go. You got to go. In the name of Jesus, leave me. And suddenly, after a few minutes of just sitting there and praying, it broke. That feeling I had was just lifted off of me. And, and I felt so different. And not just that, you know, there's a song. Um, I'm not sure if it's Amazing Grace is the one, but... I think so, where it talks about, uh, I was lost, but now I can see. I was blind, but now I can see, and all this. There is a such thing as that. You know, when God opens your eyes, it's like you'd see everything for what it really is. You know, you have, all of a, suddenly you have discernment. Um, it's like the Holy Spirit, you know, when he comes inside of you, when you decide to follow God and Jesus and you... And you, you know, believe on him and accept him. You, you, you get this discernment. And it was like after that day, and I'll tell you this much, we did not get nobody to come and pray over our house and do any kind of exorcism rituals or anything like that. But once I was delivered and my husband, okay, all the activity stopped. I mean, it that was it was simple. It was it wasn't nothing to do with. Uh, I mean, I I made up my mind right away. I had to get rid of that equipment and all my paranormal stuff. I had a whole office room full of it, you know. Um, I mean, I had all kinds of stuff. I even had like a shirt. Uh, what do you call it? A um, a printing screen, screen printing shirt thing machine, and our paranormal you know, shirt stuff, and I mean, just all kinds of things, my banners that I used at the conventions, because I would go to the conventions, and I would show that footage of that guy, you know, that was thrown, and I would, I would show that and stuff, and, and, um, you know, I mean, I had all that stuff, you know, so anyway, make a long story short, I ended up getting rid of it, I couldn't get rid of it fast enough, <laughs> and I actually had some of it for a couple weeks, because I had to put an ad on Craigslist for my uh, paranormal, um, well, I say paranormal, but it was part of the, the stuff, but it was my cameras and stuff. And that's stuff you can use for other things, obviously. So that stuff I sold and everything, but once I got rid of all that stuff and everything, I mean, everything stopped. Everything stopped. I mean, it was like such a lift. Everything, 
Oh, and I forgot to say the uh, one of the very important things, a part of that deliverance. When we were standing there talking to the deliverance, I mean the preacher, and uh, when he was talking to my husband before he started to pray for us, he noticed my husband had on a rosary bee necklace. And he asked him, he said, why do you have that on? And he said, well, for protection. And I told the man, I says, yeah, I said, I got these things all over my house. I have these rosary beads over my doors in every room. I have Bibles open in every room, you know, with the whole, the, the anointing oil on them and everything. And, um, and he told him, he says, please take that off. And I thought, what, well, you know, what's he doing? It was scary. Cause I'm like, well, that's kind of protecting him, you know? And he says, you know, he said, when you take and place your faith in an object, you're taking your faith off Jesus. And he said, you need to have faith in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And I, and boy, when he said that, I mean, it was like an epiphany. I mean, it was like, gosh, that's so true. No wonder all these things don't work. You know, it's because I wasn't believing in Jesus for him to be the protector and the deliverer. And so when we got home, like I said, I got rid of all that stuff. I got rid of all the, all those things, you know, I mean, even the Bibles, if you think about it. Um, a Bible is only our weapon when we apply it to our life, when we read it and we apply it to our life. A Bible just sitting there open with dust on it doesn't help nothing. Um, you know, demons could be all around a Bible. You see what I'm saying? It's not the Bible, the material Bible itself that saves. It's our reading it and taking it in and our, you know, applying it to our life that saves us. So, um, that was another, a valuable lesson, you know, that I had learned. And also another thing was when I had those prayers playing on that audio on my laptop that night and, <clears throat> and we got that response the way we did with that demonic spirit. What it was, was when my husband started to pray and repeat after the prayer, that that spirit got angry and threw the fan. You see what I mean? So you could play something like that in your house all day long. Demons don't care. They they know scripture. You know what I mean? But it's when you apply it to your life and you start to use it. You know what I mean? And you're calling out to God. When you call up on the Lord, that's when it works. Um, but that was another interesting thing that I had learned. Um, but anyway, I hope this helped um, people, I really do. Um, another thing uh, I really wanted to mention was another thing, uh, the, the theory of ghosts, another thing it actually attacks is our hope. Hope goes hand in hand with faith. Those two words are used interchangeably. If we were to believe that we are earthbound when we depart from our bodies, then that would be an attack on God's word regarding whether we go to heaven and to be with the Lord when we die or not. Jesus said he would never leave us nor forsake us. So if we are saved, we would go to heaven. We wouldn't be lost wandering around this earth and without Jesus. And if Jesus is always with us, that wouldn't, then wouldn't that be essentially saying that, you know, that this is a lie. You know, Jesus is always with us, and he does not forsake us. You see, once we're a believer, he does not leave us, okay? And if we're a believer and we were to die, we wouldn't be roaming around the earth lost, not being able to reach God. You see, Jesus is God in the flesh, um, so he doesn't lose us, <laughs> you know? We can be assured of that. Um, Jesus is our hope. You know, and if you look at what's at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, it says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which would also would sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is talking about our bodies. Okay, Our spirits are already gone. And then it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You see? That's why we'll be changed, okay? At an instant, we'll be changed. Our bodies will be glorified. Our be changed. We'll meet together in the air. Our spirits and our bodies, our bodies will come up to meet us if we're already dead in Christ. We'll come and, and meet us in the air and meet together, okay? Um, so a lot of people think that that means that we're in the grave like soul sleep, and that's that's false. If you compare it with other scriptures, and I go by the King James Version always, um, but that's me. <laughs> but anyway, I love you guys, and I just wanted to share my testimony. I hope it helps somebody out there. Um, I, in you know, in my past, I would have rejected uh, the truth. And I just pray to God that somebody will accept this message, you know. Um, there's always somebody out there that knows something more than someone else. So I don't claim to know everything. I'm still learning. I think we'll always be learning if God's word. Um, every time I read it, I'm learning more and more. So um, God bless you guys. And um, you guys have a good week. Bye.